thank you everyone for joining us today. And this is gonna be quite a, an interesting event. But before I get started, I want to introduce our two filmmakers, Cynthia Bastidas, who is a screenwriter and director and also executive producer, and also Aline Chikolugo, who is also the producer and unit production manager of this film. So without further ado, I'll pass the ball to Cynthia to take us through this film. Hi everyone, thank you uh, for being here. Um, the, yeah, I'm the screenwriter, director, executive producer of this film. Um, the idea of this uh, project came uh, from, you know, I had the opportunity to um, visit uh, some detention centers. Um, I've been working with um, asylum seekers through Catholic Charities and I've heard uh, many different stories um, I had the opportunity to uh, write a 10 minute play about uh, human trafficking and um, I immediately thought of an experience that really stood out to me with uh, one of the women. Um, so this piece is not about her, but it's kind of uh, her story stood out to me and inspired me to to write about you know, about her experience, but then it's also kind of an amalgamation of all the different stories that I've heard and a lot of similarities that I heard between um, a lot of the women that I was speaking to. Arlene. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. So <laughs> sorry, my computer was giving me a strange notice. Um, yes, um, so, and I, I got connected to this because Cynthia and I are really good friends um, and I have a production company and so she came to me with the idea and with the script and I just thought it was such an important and necessary story um, to be told and, uh, you know, what a wonderful opportunity to open up this conversation, not only in creating the film, but also through this event. So I'm really grateful for everyone um, that's here and to the social justice ministry um, to be putting this event on. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's get to it. Disculpe la molestia. Estaba buscando a mi hermana y apareció su perfil. No le he dicho a nadie lo de mi hermana. Agradezco mucho que me dejó desahogarme un poco. Me da lástima que no la pueda ayudar. Con su amistad basta. ¿Sabes qué es la Mara? Son como los carteles. Perdón, no quise que recordes. No, 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 está bien. Que se ha puesto muy mal aquí. <risa> Tienes que irte. Ay, no sé. Tú sabes lo que es capaz la Mara. Piensa en Carlitos. Por favor, piénsalo bien. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Cynthia and Aline, for that film. Very, very well produced, and uh, we appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you very much. So just to give the audience a rundown of the way the events are going to unfold. So next up, we're going to have our three panelists who are going to speak on various topics. But before that, Aline and Cynthia will be available after the three presenters to talk and answer your questions about the film. But first, let me just uh, let me just briefly say what's going to happen next. So Pat is gonna give us an overview of hum about human trafficking. And after Pat speaks, we'll have Jeremy who's gonna speak about the issue of forced labor in, in the agricultural industry. And then we're we'll gonna have Michelle speak about immigration and SM law, which is currently what we're facing. So before I pass it over to Pat, I'm just gonna read you a brief bio about Pat. So Pat Latona is a parishioner here at St. Francis de Sales and has been a member of the social justice ministry for five years 
And Pat is also an active member of the Zonda International, whose mission is to empower women and girls through service and advocacy. She's currently the president of a board which oversees 26 clubs in six states in the Eastern Seaboard. So since 2014, Pat has, has represented Zonda at the United Nations. And in 2015, she became actively in, involved in the NGO community to stop trafficking in persons working with over 50 worldwide organizations committed to the prevention and eradication of human trafficking in all its forms through advocacy and education. Now, Pat has presented widely on this issue, worked and volunteered at Life, Lifeway Network, which provides survivors of trafficking a safe community to live in and offer the resources they need to rebuild their lives. Pat is also the president of Empowerment Square, a recently formed nonprofit, which is built on a five-step program, all geared towards renewing and restoring the lives of survivors of human trafficking. So Pat is our first presenter and I'll pass it over to her to run through the presentation. So Pat, over to you. Take it away, thank you. And uh, welcome to all of you and good evening on behalf of uh, St. Francis de Sales. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and Cynthia, excellent film. Um, it really breaks your heart to understand what's going on with that uh, woman and how she is uh, entrapped into this whole situation. So I'm sure later we'll have a good discussion with Arlene and Cynthia about it because I'm sure there's lots of, lots of questions related to it. So having said all of that, I am now going to hopefully share my screen and just give you an overview of um, human trafficking to give you an idea of uh, what is it all about. And let's go to the slideshow. And here we go. Okay. Um, we decided actually to present this uh, in January because a couple of years ago during the Obama administration, we, he declared that January should be national. Uh, it was actually January 11th and then it changed to the uh, January was the month for recognizing the uh, issue of human trafficking. This is this first slide I uh, have to, I had to put up. I thought of it last night. It is called a gift box, and it so relates to the issue that we just uh, heard and the manipulation and coercion that went on between the trafficker and the woman in Honduras. This started at the uh, in the UK and was brought here to America actually by the group of us from the UN. And we've had it, we had it erected a couple of times. This time that you see here was at um, Union Square. And we erected it uh, in the month of January at the time that the Super Bowl was gonna be pl taking place in, um, uh, in New Jersey. Outside you'll see from the outside, it looks just like a gift box. And it is, well, here, I have something for you. I have you, I will offer you love. I will offer you protection. I will offer you a job, whatever. This is my gift to you, as the trafficker would say in his, his or her solicitation. Once you walk into the box, however, there's graphic information uh, which describes all of the uh, issues related to trafficking. So I thought it was a good um, alignment with what you had just seen. This is the definition. This is a um, by international law started or developed by the United Nations back in 2000. It has been uh, ratified by most member states and provides them with the information they need in order to develop their own uh, trafficking laws in their specific countries and states. The recruitment the transportation of individuals, the transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons, and how do they do it by means of threat or use or the use of force, fraud, coercion, or abuse of power. And the, the purpose is none other than exploitation. And of course, the end product is certainly money. This is just another graph of, of it showing the action, the means, and the purpose. Basically, if you look at it or think about it from another perspective, it really is 
trafficking is stealing freedom from individuals for profit. Uh, in some cases, the trafficker will use tricks or defraud them, physically force them, and these primarily towards victims who then are sold into the sexual trade. In many other instances, victims are lied to, uh, just as you saw in the film. They're assaulted, threatened, manipulated, which was also in the film, into working under uh, inhumane, illegal conditions. This graphic here comes from the, uh, the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. And uh, I, I just want to caution whenever anybody talks about numbers related to trafficking, it's not set in stone because it is a hidden crime. Uh, we're getting much better at uh, garnering and getting research on the numbers uh, throughout the world not only for research purposes, but also for organizations that provide services. Uh, the prevention It is also good for the law enforcement uh, industry as well. I, I'll just go through the sexual exploitation. 79% are women and about 8% are men. But if you flip that over, you will see that men uh, it's primarily men who are in the uh, who are trafficked into forced labor, but yes, women are as well. And then, of course, the other piece of this is the organ removal, which is also considered trafficking as well. Since we're talking primarily about forced labor, wanted to point out the four major areas, domestic work, construction, manufacturing, and agriculture and fishing. And that's what she was actually trafficking the young woman from Honduras into was the agriculture, particularly the, uh, the poultry industry. Uh, total, there are 40 million individuals around the globe who are caught up in trafficking at any point in time. When I began this work, you know, like six, seven, eight years ago, uh, the numbers were about 32. So it is growing exponentially um, as we speak, probably, and it is growing more during the pandemic, no question about it. Uh, geographically, um, most of forced labor does take place in Asia and in the Pacific, but also occurs in every other area of the world, as you can see in the Americas, uh, Europe and Central Asia, and of course in Africa. I just wanted to point out, I have a few little um, clips on the bottom, or pictures rather. These are primarily the major industries, not all of them, but many of the industries that are uh, embedded, if you will, where traffickers have been uh, really forcing the traffic trafficked individuals into. Coffee is one of them. There's such a demand for coffee around the world that there are more and more individuals being forced into that industry. I have shrimp, which is um, actually, if you go back to Asia and the Pacific area, that's where that comes from. A couple of years ago, there was an expose uh, in about the industry in Thailand and there was some um, reinforcements coming in and trying to, to eliminate it, but unfortunately not as successful. And the abuses that these fishermen endure, uh, endure rather, uh, during the time that they're fishing is, is um, it's unbelievable. The middle picture there is related to the computer industry and the chips and the um, the elements that go into the chips that you use every day on your cell phone uh, are mined in certain areas in uh, India and in Africa. And the conditions are uh, egregious as well. Chocolate, this is actually how I got into the social justice or St. Francis is I went up to Father Kelly and said, can we have, can we have some information in the bulletin about, 
you know, asking people to or buying chocolate for uh, either it was Halloween or uh, for Easter to please use fair trade. Because if I tell you the conditions that young, young children actually endure in the Ivory Coast, uh, getting the uh, chopping down the cocoa pods, which are eventually made into chocolate, is also the abuses is unbelievable. And then this, the, the last piece there is uh, the, the chicken. I just wanted to bring this, I won't go into it too much. Child labor is probably, um, uh, for me, one of the hardest to ever think about or talk about. A couple of years ago, uh, for a number of years, when I gave presentations, I used a film called Not My Life, which was uh, filmed across five, five continents, actually, and talked about, showed very specific examples of uh, young people, young uh, girls and boys who were trafficked, either fishing or begging or here in the United States uh, who were sex trafficked. So um, as you can see, there is uh, an estimated 168 million children who are involved in that as well. So then you go back to the whole concept of human, human trafficking. And again, I would like you to think about what you saw in the film and the vulnerability that that young woman was in because of the situation she was in with her husband, her son, the gangs, the poverty, et cetera. And that is, uh, those are the kinds of uh, environments and issues that people find themselves in. But secondly, I'd like you to look at that list and think about what we are experiencing right now in the pandemic. All of these uh, variables, poverty, unemployment, violence, poor economic opportunities are growing exponentially as we're sitting right here talking about this. So all of and there has been many, many articles related to the increase in trafficking in all its forms during the pandemic. The consequences are uh, egregious. As a registered nurse, it you know just breaks your heart to see how the physical disabilities, the diseases, but mostly the, uh, the psychological trauma that these individuals go through, whether they're being forced working in, in very, very unhealthy, unsafe conditions or uh, women who are abused sexually uh, day in and day out, 20, 30 times a day. Getting back to the, you know, the one of the reasons why uh, as obviously is exploitation, but of course it's a, it's a business and we have many, many criminal organizations currently involved in it. Uh, on the left, you'll see the, uh, it's a $150 billion industry. Again, when I started looking at this, it was 132 billion, so it's gone up. And if you compare it to three major companies that are here in the United States for profit combined, Walt Disney, uh, Coca-Cola, and Starbucks, they make 144 billion. So it is a true money maker. So there's ways that we have to really think about how we're going to uh, uh, eliminate this. Um, this pie chart on the right just gives you an idea of how it is broken up and where the monies are coming from. Sex is uh, sexual exploitation, uh, 99, and forced labor, 43, and domestic servitude is $8 billion industry. So just the next few slides and then I'll be finished, but I did want to bring you into some ways organizations, corporations, tech companies, and what you can do uh, as it relates to trafficking. This is the one, one uh, example of uh, corporations, which are um, actually the financial institutions, Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility. And as you can see, their mission is to build a more just and sustainable world by integrating social values into corporate 
and investor actions. And uh, these are the areas that it, they specifically work on. So if you are considering investing in anything or your company is investing in anything, then uh, this is a, uh, this is an, I would advise you to look into this particular uh, corporation. These are just some tech companies and tech companies now are forming collaborations using the technology that they have, they have garnered to say, okay, how can we explore this? How can we find people who have been trafficked? How can we help law enforcement? So the tech against trafficking is such uh, is such a, a collaboration. Uh, Thorn was started a couple of years ago by a uh, by an actor, and of course I don't remember his name. Uh, Eschner. I'm not going to tr even try to say it. Anyway, uh, it is. It's it's been very successful. They have developed an app. And it provides law enforcement here in the United States in finding children who have been uh, sexually exploited. And I was looking on their website recently, and this SAFE is a, um, it seems to be an app or a platform that parents can use in order to put on their, uh, on their children's laptops on their computers, and they then can monitor what they are looking at because as much as technology is good for us, it and and as you can see here, good for the um, uh, the human and uh, elimination of human trafficking. It's also unfortunately increased uh, the ability and the availability of traffickers soliciting young people because they're on the on the internet so much. This last piece down here is relates to an organization. It's actually an umbrella organization of different financial institutions all over the world that have got together and say, you know, we've got to look at finances. We've got to look at the banking industry as it relates to trafficking. We've got 150 billion there. They're making these traffickers. Where is the money? Uh, where is it hidden? So the whole idea is to be making it much more transparent. So, uh, Anyone really can join the fight against human trafficking. Uh, I'd like you to think about some of these ideas. And I put up uh, uh, some, you know, sites that you might be interested in going into. Uh, you, learning the indicators of human trafficking. Polaris is an organization right here in the United States, and uh, they're, they have an excellent website. They've been around for a while. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Uh, learn about it. Uh, there's plenty of fabulous and very interesting and very worthwhile organizations and agencies around the world that you can find to learn and, and, and read about the stories. Uh, going back to the whole idea of, of uh, forced labor in the various industries, you have to become an informed consumer. Um, and there's different ways of doing that. One of them is this is a, an app that you can download. It was put out by the International Labor Organization, which is part of the UN, and it's called Sweat and Toil. It will tell you the garments and whatever you're purchasing. Uh, is it related to forced labor? Uh, going back to the internet, the internet safety, Shared Hope, which is another organization, has a great in, uh, guideline for you if your parents, grandparents, teachers, to teach and educate children what they should or should not be doing on the internet. If you're buying anything, look for the fair trade uh, certificate on their packaging. There's plenty of organizations out there. I personally shop at uh, 10,000 villages. That's where I buy a lot of my Christmas gifts. Go into Whole Foods. You need some chocolate or coffee, buy fair trade. Uh, it's very simple. If you just start with that, you'll be doing so much. Lots of legislation has come out of Congress over many, many years now. Um, the uh, Trafficking uh, Protection Act has been around for 20 years. When these pieces of legislation come out, if you are aware of them, contact your representative and ask them to please uh, 
um, you know, vote for them. Volunteer, donate. Uh, if you own a business, offer a job to a survivor. You're a college student. Maybe you would like to join a club and raise awareness, or maybe you would like to get involved with a campaign to turn your campus into a, free, a fair trade campus. Journalists, healthcare workers, law enforcement, learn the signs. There's a, a number of different uh, organizations that would help you. The, the Blue Campaign, which comes out of our Homeland Security, is an excellent website that will provide you with all different kinds of um, uh, how to and understanding of human trafficking. After we're finished tonight, I'd like you to, if you would, uh, go on to slaveryfootprint.org and take this. Um, it, it is a tool. You put in information about yourself. It's kind of fun to look at. They've done an excellent job. Ask you specific information, you know, uh, female, male, how old you are, how many children you have, do you rent, uh, how much jewelry do you have, uh, how much, you know, technology do you use, etc. The end will tell you how many slaves you have. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating and it's a true eye opener. Polaris, I mentioned before, I'm also going to ask each one of you now to take your phone and put in this number. It is the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. The number is 1-888-373-7888. I have it in my phone. If you see something, say something, but not to the individual that you think is being trafficked. Instead, call this number. They are equipped to handle all different kinds of uh, calls. You explain to them what you see and they then will sort of triage it. And then if it's, they really believe it's a person being trafficked, they will then, um, they will call the local police. Uh, I'm assuming that we're going to be able to get some of this information to you, so I'm not going to go through this. And this is also uh, information as well. And that's it. So thank you. And hope to hear some more questions later. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, for that very informative and lots of action items for us to do after this presentation. So thank you very much, Pat. And don't forget, continue to put your questions and answer in the question and answer text box and we'll address those questions after our next two presenters. So don't forget to put those questions and answers there. We're definitely gonna address them. So without further ado, I'm gonna talk briefly about our next presenter. Our next presenter is Jeremy McLean. Jeremy McLean. And he's gonna talk about the issue of forced labor in the agricultural industry. But before I pass the ball over to him, let me just read you a brief bio about Jeremy. So Jeremy comes to us from Justice in Motion, having worked nearly 20 years on different Latin American projects. A native of Wyoming, he has extensive international experience having lived and studied in Mexico, Panama, Peru, Japan, and Israel. He has been actively involved in promoting low wage worker rights since 2001 as a staff attorney and outreach worker at the Worker Justice Center for New York and as a worker organizer with World Migrant Ministry so Jeremy has advocated for many clients focusing on agriculture and other low wage workers through legal representation, rights education, and efforts to train other advocates or otherwise people who are exploited. He has assisted clients in obtaining immigration remedies available to trafficking and other crime victims and in pursuing civil redress for those who have been trafficked or exploited. So Jeremy, thank you for joining us and I pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, get this set up here real quick. All right, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I work at Justice in Motion. I'm going to talk about the trafficking of temporary foreign workers in agriculture. Um, quickly, Justice in Motion is dedicated to the principle that the reach of justice should not stop at the border. Uh, business, people, everything's global and justice should be as well. And that's our main mission. If you go to our website, you can see some of the resources that we have where we talk about these temporary foreign work programs and some of the things that uh, we can do to prevent trafficking and exploitation on these visas. So 
uh, in seeing the video and listening to Pat, um, human trafficking is a difficult crime to uncover and prosecute. But if there are themes that can be applied broadly to all types of human trafficking, and that is difficult. Um, one of the things that I think is, is evident through the, the film and what Pat said is traffickers identify weaknesses in victims. They identify vulnerabilities, often offer a solution to that weakness or that need, use those weaknesses to create additional vulnerabilities and then exploit their victims based on those needs and weaknesses. One of the problems is, is that sometimes our system is set up in a way that it creates additional vulnerabilities besides the typical conditions that people might come from in poverty situations, corruption, violence. Uh, often the legal systems and political systems that we have in place create additional vulnerabilities. And I wanna talk about some of those uh, in relation to government programs here in the United States. Um, what is a guest worker program? These are programs where people come from foreign countries for a temporary time with a visa to work uh, for US employers. They have an expiration date and must return to their country at the end of their visa. The important point here is that <clears throat> if you leave that job that is tied to your visa, to your immigration status, you're instantly deportable. Um, so the system is set up so that the risks to leaving your job is deportation. And that becomes problematic when uh, employers use that as leverage against visa workers to get them to do things that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the H-2A program. These are seasonal jobs in the US focused on agriculture. Um, it's farm labor, harvesting, planting crops, tobacco and sheep herding are some of the bigger groups or sectors in agriculture that use these type of workers. There's no limit on the number of people that can come every year to participate in these programs. In 2018, there was over 200,000 participants in the United States with an H-2A visa. And this program is exploding. In five years or less, the numbers have doubled. And this program is gonna be used more and more in the agricultural industry here in the United States. Typically, you can only stay for one year or less when you have this visa. Just uh, to represent the numbers, you can see from 2014 or so to 2018, the numbers doubled here in the United States. And again, this and other temporary foreign work programs are exploding here in the United States. As a small case study, just to point out how this happens, um, in the last few years, uh, a case has been prosecuted by the, the federal government where 14 H-2A workers were trafficked to Georgia and later Wisconsin um, by recruiters and crew leaders who had contracts with different farmers in these states. Um, they originally came to harvest vine crops, cucumbers and squash in Georgia. Before they arrived in the country, they paid recruiters hundreds of dollars and in many cases had to take out loans using property deeds as collateral to even get on a list to get a job. Once they arrived in the United States, their personal documents were confiscated. They were prohibited from moving outside of the, the camp in their homes, and they were also limited in who they could talk to. Over two years, these traffickers stole from these 14 and other workers almost a million dollars. The workers were threatened with physical and financial harm, with immigration consequences, and besides working for nothing, the work conditions were horrible. They worked excruciating hours, sometimes 16 or more hours a day. Many of them suffered from heat, heat stroke and actually passed out in the fields. When they needed medical attention, it was denied to them unless they paid $100 or more just for a ride to the hospital to their contractors and labor recruiters. And then when they were moved against the conditions of the program to Wisconsin, they were given fake documents and taken to another state where they had even fewer connections and orientation on where they were and where they could turn. So again, this program, uh, beyond the basic needs that, that would motivate someone to come to the United States to work in these programs, create additional vulnerabilities. And this is a list of a few of them. And I wanna highlight the first and the fourth one 
Um, these programs, again, tie workers to specific employers for a determined amount of time. They also usually involve high recruitment costs. Um, these programs prohibit the requirement of payment to get on a job list or to secure a job. However, it is routine and that regularly happens to get a job in the United States on an H-2A visa. Uh, someone is gonna pay a recruiter hundreds if not thousands of dollars in some cases to get on a list, to potentially get a job or to actually get a job to come to the United States. And how does this affect and create vulnerabilities in workers? Um, this quote is something that I heard something like this very often working with agricultural workers in upstate New York before um, working here in, in New York City. It's basically, I'm not keeping you here, you're free to leave. However, if you choose to leave, I'll report you to immigration, you will be deported, you will be prosecuted, and you could never come back to the United States. And a lot of those threats are actually true, which provides the employer or the recruiter or the contractor an incredible amount of leverage to get workers to do or stand conditions that they wouldn't normally tolerate. Um, this is a direct quote from one of the first cases that prosecuted the human trafficking on temporary foreign uh, visas. Uh, you can look up this case, the Pickle case out of Oklahoma. And this was sent around this quote to all of the uh, employees when they started to ask questions, um, ask about wages, about hours, about where they were living, about the food that they were getting. They were basically told, we can't keep you here, but there are severe consequences if you leave. The second quote is from a survivor of labor trafficking here in the United States, who basically said the same thing. Uh, I suppose I could have left, but I did not want to risk my immigration status and become deportable. It is very important for these people, uh, these participants in these programs to maintain their status and have the option to return to work in the United States in the future. And that threat of deportation puts all of that at risk for them. Shifting to recruitment costs, um, some reports that have come out in the last few years uh, estimate with you know, surveys of some subset of this population that the average costs in the last few years have been around $600. Um, almost 50% of the workers surveyed who had to pay these costs didn't have the cash on hand to do that and had to take out a loan to cover these costs and the costs that they have to front for travel, visa fees, food and lodging on their way from typically Mexico to the United States to work on a farm. Uh, in an extreme case, and it's a little bit older, but in 2005, a Thai worker participant in the H2A program paid $11,000 before they even started working in the United States. Um, again, this creates an incredible imbalance of power when you show up at a job with debt that you have to pay down with your wages. So if the conditions the wages, um, the hours, the housing is not what you expected. Uh, then comes the statement, well, you can leave, but you'll become deportable. But the, the participants are also thinking about their need for a job and income to pay off these loans. Uh, typically, these are not loans that you go to a bank to. These are loans made by other people who are looking for vulnerable situations to exploit. And if you don't pay these loans, there are severe consequences. Um, they take your property, they threaten you with violence, um, they hurt you and your family if you don't pay. Uh, none of these things are universal, but these are typical scenarios that many participants in this program, H2A and others, have to think about when they want to make a decision to leave a job that's not optimal or what was promised. Quickly, um, what can be done in these cases? Uh, there needs to be a lot done to kind of reset this power imbalance. And some of the things that can happen to do this is, first of all, to provide more government oversight. Um, just talking about the state of New York 
you have engagement from state Department of Labor and federal Department of Labor that do inspections and try to visit workers and see what's going on. Uh, their capacity and resources would allow them to visit anywhere between two and 5% of the farms uh, over a multi-year period. There is no way that the federal government with its current resources and allotment can visit every single worker or even every single work site uh, to make sure that things are being done above board. Much more resources need to go out to ensure that workers have options to ask questions or report violations of their contract labor law or if they are victims of human trafficking. Another thing that typically happens is sometimes a worker will complain uh, officially or even just to their crew leader or employer, but they suffer the risk of being put on a blacklist. And again, the ability to return and have the option to work in the United States in subsequent seasons is very important. Um, once you're on a blacklist, it's very hard to secure employment, even with a different recruiter or a different employer, um, somehow in many cases, these lists are shared between recruiters and non-compliant workers are simply not invited to come back or not contracted in subsequent years. There needs to be more consequences for violating the law. Um, one of the things that I always think about when we talk about what can we do to prosecute traffickers, to bring traffickers to justice, there is legally uh, a defined line that what is trafficking and what is not. Uh, it's not in practice always easy to distinguish a trafficking situation from a situation of abuse and exploitation. For some reason, um, prosecutors and probably the public at large tend to care more about things that can be classified as trafficking legally and less about things like discrimination in the workplace, wage theft, um, abuse and mistreatment, non-compliance with contracts. We need to do more to enforce all of the terms and conditions for these workers when they come to the United States and not just care about situations that reach such an extreme point that they can be classified as trafficking. There's a lot of things that happen that build up to a trafficking situation that we're not monitoring to a sufficient degree. Another thing that happens, visa shopping, um, employers and recruiters are very savvy. And once they have been excluded or can't figure a way to exploit workers from a certain category or on a certain visa, we'll figure out ways to get workers through different programs on a different visa. Uh, there are programs run through the DOL and there are programs run through the Department of State and the rules are very different. Employers have figured out how to manipulate systems or find, again, these vulnerabilities to exploit with different workers under different sets of rules. And we need to be vigilant that that doesn't happen. Another problem is once uh, survivors are identified, it's very difficult to um, locate the resources that are necessary for general uh, sustenance and basic needs once you can no longer work after making a complaint, perhaps being fired or being out of the time period of your visa. We need to care more about what we're giving to those who complain and have legitimate concerns about the treatment that they've received at work. Part of that is a temporary status after reporting abuse. There are visas that are granted to victims of human trafficking and other violent crimes. But again, when we're talking about violations that don't amount clearly to human trafficking, those kind of protections of temporary status uh, a visa are not granted to someone who's just been a victim of wage theft, for example. We need to streamline those processes and make sure that people are protected and taken care of while they go through a legal process to try and demand that their rights be upheld. And again, going back to these themes, um, it's very tough for someone who's coming without documentation or someone on these visas to demand that their rights be upheld. It's even worse when the systems that we have in place create additional vulnerabilities 
for people who come to the United States to work. Uh, and that's something that we should care more about. And as Pat said, that's something that all of us can participate in through political action, calling our representatives, paying attention to legislation and trying to get these changes enacted. Um, the criminalization of people without documents or people who overstay a visa or people who don't wanna put up with conditions and become out of status uh, needs to stop. We need to do more to set up protections so that those vulnerabilities aren't created by this system that should protect those who come to work in the United States. Um, there's so much to talk about in these issues and all of these visas. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. You can go to our website. We have resources that point out how much trafficking occurs on this visa category and others. It happens all throughout the United States in every visa category to workers with a lot of education and workers with little education. Traffickers do not care. If they can find a vulnerability, they will exploit it. And we should do more uh, to try and prevent that. And I welcome you to, to join us at Justice in Motion and the rest of the panelists here to try and prevent some of this abuse from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that very informative presentation. And you also gave us some action items and ways we can take some action after this presentation. So I appreciate that. So just want to let you, everyone know that please continue to type your questions in the Q&A. We'll definitely address them after our next panelist speaks. So don't forget to type the Q&As. We're not ignoring them. We're definitely going to address them. So our next panelist is Michelle Brené, and she's going to talk about immigration and asylum laws, its current state and where it's headed. But before I give her the floor, I'm just going to read a brief bio about her. So Michelle Brené is the Senior Director of the Migrant Rights and Justice Program at the Women's Refugee Commission. She's one of the nation's foremost experts in U.S. asylum protections, migrant children, and detention policies for migrants, with more than three decades of experience in the field. Michelle conducts research and monitors policy, develops recommendations, and advocates for the critical protection needs of migrant women, children, and other vulnerable migrant populations in the United States while holding governments and policymakers accountable. So Michelle, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Um, and thank you to um, Arlene and Cynthia for that um, really powerful film. It, it was really great. I was really excited to see it and it did not disappoint. Um, uh, I think that the timing and the order of the of these um, of our presentations is perfect because I am going to start off at the point of um, how our um, our failure to offer a, a reasonable and accessible protection system really increases risks risks of trafficking. Um, I don't think it's any secret to anybody who's listening in uh, today that uh, the last five years have been a real all out attack on asylum seekers, um, on refugees and on people seeking protection. And there seems to have been an especial sort of, the cruelty was sort of almost especially focused on uh, women, children, and families in, in really large part. And obviously the, the big issue of family separation um, really uh, hit home for a lot of people and brought, I think just really to the forefront what, what some of these policies mean when they're put into practice. Um, I think the important thing to note is that very often these policies on, on closing the border or on deterring people are presented as a way of, of stopping an overwhelming flow of people. Um, but it's important to note that first of all, uh, there's a lot of misconception about what, who's arriving at the border, why and how. Um, but also, you know, for people who are seeking asylum or seeking protection or fleeing really difficult or horrible situations, which is um, really what we're seeing and talking about here with the majority of the, of the population that we're talking about, um, making it difficult to get into the United States or making it difficult to get to safety does not prevent people from seeking safety, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's sort of obvious, but that's not how our policies are drafted. Uh, policies are drafted in order to prevent people from seeking safety, which is really backwards, right? Because not only does it not prevent people um, from seeking safety, that's an innate uh, 
uh, instinct. And certainly, I don't know that there's any stronger instinct besides uh, protecting oneself than protecting one's children, right? And we've really seen that in recent years with uh, the focus on families and children. But, um, but it also creates heightened dangers. So when you obstruct or make access to, to safety or to getting to um, opportunity more difficult, you make it more dangerous. Uh, not only for the people who remain and aren't able to leave, but also for people who are making that journey. Uh, because as I said, in, in critical situations, what we see is that people leave anyway. It's push factors that are, that are driving people um, out and they'll take what they can get, right? Uh, so when it is more difficult, what we see, generally speaking, is increased trafficking, increased um, deaths in deserts or en route, increased sexual assault on the journey, increased exploitation. Um, you know, for example, when we, uh, even under the Obama years, going back even before the last four years, um, there was a, a reaction to clamping down on smuggling and, and decreasing um, migration. And almost immediately what you see is that prices go up, you know, more people have to um, give the titles to their homes in order to get somewhere or have to promise future work in order to um, pay for their journey. And all of that, as you saw both from the film and from the two presenters previously lead into these situations and make them worse, not better. Um, so just really briefly going back to uh, the, one of the common answers we, you know, questions I get from people, maybe not this group, because you seem a little bit more informed, but is, you know, why don't people just get in line, right? Why don't they come the right way? Why don't they come the legal way? Well, first of all, you heard just now from, from Jeremy and, and Pat that uh, sometimes what seems like the legal way isn't so great, right? Um, there's, there's power inequities and a lot of um, risk still there because of the way our system is set up. But in that context, employment is one of the ways to come, but there are really limited ways um, to come to the United States, uh, even if it's for safety. So employment is one. Um, the other is family petitions, and those again are pretty limited to people who have uh, status in the United States and pretty direct relatives and the further along away you get in terms of uh, parent-child relationship and uh, spouse, the longer those waits might be, and especially if you're from a country in which there are long lists because there are limits to how many people we allow in every year under those visas. Um, there are some special other kinds of visas uh, related to that, U visas, which are victim visas, and T visas, which are related to trafficking, and I can get to that in, in a moment. And there's the famous lottery that President Trump uh, tried to eliminate. Um, and then lastly, there's asylum, asylum or refugee status, and, and those are somewhat similar but different paths. Um, asylum is protection offered um, for somebody who is being persecuted. Um, on account of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or uh, a particular social group. So it's a pretty limited definition, but it is encompassed in just how you would imagine. The idea is that it's to protect, offer protection to people who are um, being persecuted uh, on account of something that in, in general they can't change. Um, refugees are basically the same thing. It's the same definition. It's just that refugees, you're outside of the United States and applying through a, a sort of international process. Asylum is at the border of the United States or at a port of entry. So you could come to an airport, for example, um, and request uh, asylum if you got that far, which used to be more common before 9-11, um, but now it's pretty far hard to get um, as far as an actual US um, destination without a visa unless you're coming across the, the border. Um, so all of those, um, those options are fairly limited. So for most people, there is no line to get into, uh, and people who are fleeing, uh, violence or persecution generally, um, you know, ask for asylum, which I want to emphasize is a legal right, right? So there's often also this misunderstanding that people who are seeking asylum are illegal, uh, there is a legal right to seek asylum. The United States is committed to that both under international law and US law. Um, the issue is, uh, is how you access that, 
And what really we've seen, especially over the last four years, is a complete blockage of access to that kind of protection. Um, the list of the ways that has happened would take me a very long time to go through because what's been really impressive, in, if that's the right word, uh, with this administration is the number of layers they've added on to the obstacles. So that even if you remove one obstacle, there's still a whole series of them in the way to getting, to getting access. Um, some of the ones that are best known are, um, well, first there was the attempts to separate families. Um, that was very much presented as a way of, um, especially initially as a way of combating trafficking, right? The administration claimed that people were um, using children um, for trafficking purposes and that they were separating for protection. Um, the irony of that or the twistedness of that is really um, somewhat shocking for those of us who are in the field because everything they were doing was actually making trafficking more of a risk, especially for children. Um, and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which is the what they were trying to actually get rid of, which offers protections for children, especially um, coming across the border, is um, they were trying to overturn it and the measures in there are exactly what was needed to protect uh, children that they were refusing to implement. Um, uh, metering was another thing that is referred to the, the system in which uh, ports of entry, when people come to the border and ask uh, for asylum, um, US officials would actually block them from entering and say, sorry, we don't have any more room anymore. There's no more asylum in the US, uh, we're full you need to turn around and go back. So not even letting them access the US in order to ask for that protection and literally just turning people away. Um, the other that has gotten a lot of notoriety and is really being focused on right now is, uh, we call it Remain, Remain in Mexico. Um, the official name is MPP, um, which again is a twisted uh, acronym. So I'm gonna stick to Remain in Mexico, but um, the concept there is that they forced people who did get through um, in order to legally ask for asylum and said, okay, fine, you can um, ask for asylum and we'll put you through the process, but you've got to wait in Mexico while we decide your case. And then sent people back across the border into Mexico where they were waiting and are still waiting in extremely dangerous conditions um, while their case is being heard. And there's quite a big backlog. So that, that time period is very long. And then of course COVID hit, so they just kept, they canceled all those hearings um, and people have been waiting for years now. Um, the conditions again, were bad enough to start with, but as I mentioned, when you close off borders and you make it more difficult for people to access protection, things get even worse. So over this time, we've seen an increase in organized crime, an increase in trafficking, an increase in um, smuggling that turns into trafficking, uh, and really some horrific cases of kidnapping and, and other dangers. And you know, a lot of the people in that situation become quite desperate. As I said, making it more difficult to access safety doesn't stop people from trying, right? So there again, we had a second form of family separation in which we saw parents who were living with, these, with their children in extremely dangerous conditions and maybe had family or somebody in the United States um, to send their children to would um, you know, began actually sending their children by themselves because they had a better chance of getting in. And there again, you had a whole other kind of separation that really put people, uh, children at extreme risk, um, not to mention the trauma involved. Um, we also have uh, safe country um, agreements where the United States started saying that if you pass through any other country on your way to the United States, you have to go there and not to the United States. A lot of people think that's the law. That was not the law. That is not part of the Refugee Convention. And it's not part of US asylum law. Um, people go where they know somebody and where there's an opportunity. And that's how it's been um, since asylum was, um, since its, its inception. Um, so, uh, so there you have all sort of the, the way things have been exasperated. I know people are really eager to hear um, what is now going to change or what can change. So the really good news is that, um, you know, the Biden administration came in promising a lot of reform on specifically some of these issues and issues that will um, open up and make it safer for people to, to come to the United States, to, to, to get to a safer place. 
and hopefully um, those can be extended beyond just sort of the initial basics and, and into some of these deeper reforms that we really need uh, that Jeremy and Pat talked about. Um, just some initial pieces. Uh, the administration has already indicated that they want to address root causes. So obviously that's one really obvious way that will take time, but they can um, help in terms of preventing uh, uh, these sorts of issues at the source, right? If people don't need to flee, if they are secure, if you address poverty issues. Uh, domestic violence, which was touched on in the film, is a huge issue that this administration, both domestic violence and gang violence actually are two areas specifically this administration tried to cut off as um, reasons for getting asylum. Uh, that really need to be reversed. And hopefully this administration will do that, but also looking into humanitarian assistance um, in regions where it's needed in order to address root causes and hopefully, especially over time, prevent the need for people to, to flee their countries. Um, building protection systems regionally. So not everybody wants to come to the United States, but there's not necessarily accessibility to safety in other places on the way. But a lot of people do go to other, other countries. Um, this is another question I get a lot. So for example, um, during the years um, of uh, 2012 to 2015, when we saw an increase in the number of families and children and girls coming to the United States fleeing gang violence in Central America, um, there was also a huge increase in the number of asylum seekers from those countries in other countries of the region. So Costa Rica and Panama and Belize, they all saw an increase in the number of people seeking protection and fleeing uh, violence. It's not just the U.S. So building protection systems there is another way um, to help. Um, and we expect the Biden administration to do that. Our concern is that the that, that assistance go into actually helping communities and helping with accountability and, and, and safety as opposed to bolstering um, corrupt or, um, or problematic governments because there is a lot of political unrest in the area and that can't be ignored. Um, they have talked about creating a task force um, to reunify families. That is fantastic. I um, was very, very, personally involved in that issue and am thrilled that they want to do something about it, but it is really important that it go beyond just contacting parents. It really has to be about reunifying, providing support, and making sure that that doesn't happen again. And so there's a lot of policies that need to be addressed in order to prevent future separations. Um, addressing the asylum laws, getting rid of Title 42, I didn't even mention that. Um, when COVID hit, the Trump administration basically shut off the border and literally they, they use the term expels people um, back into Mexico or back at, directly into their home country without even reviewing whether it's safe to do so uh, based on a claim that it is um, necessary due to the pandemic, even though we know now that actual experts in the CDC um, made clear that that was not um, a public health uh, advised practice. So that's really generally, um, sort of some of the things that can happen, but I don't wanna to take too much time and I wanna leave time for questions. So I am gonna wrap it up there. Um, but in terms of what you all can do, you know, let, let people know what you think has to happen and don't let this um, idea that there's too many people coming to our borders seeking help and assistance, um, let you say that it's not possible. We are absolutely possible, uh, capable as a country to, um, to support the number of people seeking protection. There, it's not bigger numbers than we've had historically. It's always gone up or down. And if you look at sort of what that is compared to our country and our capacity overall, it's always been a boon and a, and a privilege in our country uh, to accept these populations as opposed to turning them away. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for that. So much information and so much valuable stuff. Thank you for sharing with us. We appreciate that and your time as well. So I'm going to, we're going to dive straight to the questions because there are a lot of questions in here. So I'm going to go for the first question by Tim Smith. And it says, are people who traffic more for sex or for work? Does the sex or age of the victim matter? And uh, I believe that's a question for you, Pat. Okay. Could you uh, repeat it? I was unmuting. It's uh, the question was: Are people trafficked more for sex or for work? And does the sex or age of the victim matter? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yes. To answer the first part, the uh, more people are trafficked 
for sexual exploitation than for forced labor. And the age, um, the ages range from actually here in the United States, uh, girls are put into trafficking as young as 11, 12, and 14. So um, no, age does, the, the younger, actually the younger, the better for the trafficker and for the, uh, the John. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, Pat. Another question here says by Danielle, she says, with domestic work, how would you find out if someone was a victim of trafficking? Who wants to take that one? Well, probably the best answer to that would be um, if they had been trafficked in many instances and they come from uh, from another part of the uh, across across the, the, the pond, as they say, they would um, may or may not have their uh, their documents available because many times the trafficker will take their passports and their uh, any kind of visa that they might have as used as collateral against them, um, which is probably something that we saw in the, in the film as well. So you would look at that. Michelle is, is saying yes. Am, am I correct on that? Okay. Cool. Jeremy, you're about to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, if I could add to that. Um, again, there are other visa programs that are restricted to domestic work. The A3G5 visa program where diplomats can bring in, you know, servants to work in their home. It's an incredibly vulnerable situation. You have workers who live where they work. And in cases where there is trafficking, um, that person may not see or interact with anybody besides the family and the diplomat for years. And so it's very difficult to find out if that person is being trafficked. And that's why, you know, in a lot of these cases, we really need the government to kind of step up and take a, a greater role in monitoring some of these situations and providing options or a place to go for questions because it's very easy to isolate someone in that, that situation. Yeah, can I just jump in on one thing? Because Jeremy mentioned this before, but I think it's really worth repeating. I think criminalizing the absence of status, right? Criminalizing not having the right documents also really exacerbates that and is extremely problematic. And, you know, one of the things that we've been discussing is that, um, you know, in other areas legally, right, if you're out of status environmentally, or if you, if you fail to get a permit, or if you fail to do those things, the law doesn't usually put you in jail or deport you for it, right? What they do is try to get you to comply. So you pay a fine or you do what you need to do to get the permit that, that they want you to have in order to encourage compliance as opposed to punishing. Um, people who can't access that system. So that's a really, really important shift that I think needs to happen that would make a big difference. And, and also, uh, I mentioned before the International Labor Organization, uh, which works with um, member states, countries throughout the world related, and they're one of their major focus right now is on the domestic worker, because just as Jeremy and Michelle have said, they are just so vulnerable. I mean, they are just, they're hidden. We don't know where they are and how they're being abused. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So this question is from Kristen McDonough, and she said, Jeremy, is it true that companies who take advantage of young seasonal migrant workers in the hospitality industry include Disney? an iconic family friendly company. And she said, can Disney be shamed into changing such policies? Um, it's very true. Uh, you look at the visa system, there is a visa called the Disney visa. And it's just for Disney basically that allows them to bring in seasonal workers to work at their resorts. Um, there have been cases where they and other big companies, the Hershey chocolate company, you know, have, have been involved in scandals where they didn't pay the promised wages. They were essentially charging for housing, trips, participation, student. And this is a program that's specifically geared towards university age students from abroad. Um, they were making virtually no money because of all the, the fees that they had to pay to participate to, to, for housing, for food, et cetera. Yes. Who is profiting? I mean, we all are. Uh, you know, Pat's point to like your slavery footprint. Do you consume Disney? Do you eat shrimp from whatever, you know, we are all benefiting from this system. Um, 
And it's extremely difficult to kind of suss out where the responsibility lies. But to some degree, our choices uh, can really make a difference in some of these, these instances. If, if we could create the kind of critical mass social consciousness that we could shame Disney and get them to change their practices, that would be amazing. But um, not to be cynical, but it often seems that there's just too much apathy in not just American consumers, but consumers to care about figuring out where these supply chains lead to and how we can make choices that would avoid us participating in these exploitative systems. Yeah, thank you for that. It's a tough situation. I have a question here from Tim Smith as, as well. Again, he said, will groups like MS-13 help trafficking by putting more pressure on locals to get payback? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is yeah, I'm not sure I do either, yeah. but yeah. I can guess actually. So let me just take a shot at it. I think maybe what they're getting at is, um, so actually uh, the, oh, are they gonna have them explain? No. Uh, a lot of times the pressure back home. So there's two pieces, right? I mean, one is the the fear of what's going to happen if they go back, the fear that drove them out anyway and sort of drives people into dangerous situations or more dangerous situations, right? Like you saw in the film, um, making them vulnerable. But also there is this whole issue of um, kidnapping and what happens when you go back. So we get, for example, a lot of cases in which people who are making the journey, not only have they paid somebody and are at risk and, and don't know what, what, what's happening to them. But then very often they are kidnapped either by the very um, person they're traveling with um, or others along the journey and more money is extorted from them um, on the journey in order to be released. And that helps both where they identify a family member or somebody in the United States who they think might have money or sometimes even phone calls back to traffickers or gangs or cartels in the home country where they're saying, hey, we have the rest of your family here. And if you don't pay now that you're in the United States and we know you have money, you're, you're gonna send it to us. So it goes a lot of ways. Even families who are left behind get extorted by the gangs who say, we know your sister went to the United States. We know she has money so you can pay us. So there's multiple levels in which that, that extortion happens. and it beats trafficking. Yeah, thanks Thanks for that response, Michelle. We have a question here from Patricia Cole, and she said, what are some of the ways the new Biden administration can help in the fight to end human trafficking in the US and across the globe? Who wants to take that one? Um, Go ahead, Jeremy. Just really quickly, I, I think on a very basic level, something that um, we should remember and pay attention to is, is rhetoric. Um, it really matters how you talk about um, immigrants, migrant workers, uh, people who are not from the United States, people who are different. And I can only imagine in the next four years, there's gonna be a much friendlier discussion in the way that you know different groups, caravans are characterized. Um, that's you know not a policy piece or anything, but it, it really does matter. The way that we talk about and consider these groups um, influences the way that they're treated. And if we can't see them as humans, then it's, it's hard for us to change systems that will prevent the abuse and the exploitation that we're talking about here. I, I agree. Um... But I do, I also know, and I mean, he's just started his administration, but prior to it, he was talking about, or there was pressure on him or discussion among uh, his potential administration and other organizations who are in the field of uh, anti-trafficking, that there should probably be there was two focus. One was on the immigration issue, as well as the uh, looking at and potentially changing our immigration policies here in the United States, uh, which is a monumental task and it's done over and over again, but it certainly needs to be addressed. And then the other piece also was about um, looking at forced labor uh, more intently 
versus sexual exploitation. I mean, the two of them are both egregious, obviously, but uh, so much emphasis, not enough, but a lot of emphasis has been on um, the sexual industry and not enough as far as these other groups on uh, forced labor. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Thanks for that, Pat. Now, this question comes from uh, Don Mason and he says, does, does the U.S. minimum wage laws, does it apply to immigrant workers as well? It does. Um, any, I, I guess you would call it floor uh, statutes, regulations must apply to those workers, no matter their documentation status. Uh, so if you have a, the federal minimum wage is always going to be the bottom floor. If you're in a state like New York that has a higher state minimum wage, that wage must be paid no matter the status of that worker. If those workers are participating in some of these visa programs, it's written into the program that they must be paid an even higher wage uh, with, I guess, the thought that you don't price out local workers uh, from the labor market by dropping wages to some minimum. But yes, all of these labor laws must and do apply in every instance to workers, no matter their documentation status, their visa status, or where they come from. Good. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Jeremy. So, Pat, this is a question directly to you. Um, can you share the info on how to be a better consumer and what companies you were thinking about intentionally trafficking? Um, my suggestion would be, I mean, there's a long list of them, but if you just go on to fairtrade.org, and that will bring the viewer to a, they have a, a, an explanation about what fair trade is and fair trade uh, certification. Thanks, Arlene. And um, also, if you then scroll down, it will give you a list of all of the diff many of the different organizations related to different products that uh, you can then tap into. And it's for all countries, many of them. Um, Australia all the way to the United States. Good, thank you for that. For that. And uh, we have a question here that says, uh, picking back of the last question, is there any data on companies who are known for taking advantage of migrant workers and where can we find this information? I think this is for you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, again, it's, it's hard, you know, in, in a sense of a supply chain to always, you know, link um, products that are made with you know, human trafficking victims, slave labor back to, you know, retailers, that's always difficult. But there are plenty of reports out there that talk about, you know, um, companies like Disney, Hershey's that abuse certain visa programs. Um, it's certainly, I mean, all of us probably have Google alerts, you know, to talk about news stories that come across on different visas. It's difficult. It's very, very hard to figure out how all this is intertwined. Um, but it is something that we all should try to do a little bit better. Um, typically for, you know, the program that I'm talking about now is H2A. You can look by state and see which growers have been involved. Um, sometimes states will produce a list of recruiters that have been sanctioned or banned, and that is helpful. Um, but it would take a lot more effort from the government and from us as consumers to really kind of root out the actors who were responsible for some of this abuse. Yeah, it uh, definitely involves a lot of effort. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. Um, question for you, Cynthia, and also Erlene. Why did you decide to do the film? What was your, what was your hope for its impact? You know, what did you hope to achieve by doing the film? Um, so uh, this film, so I had, um, I was very impacted by an experience that I had at the border at a detention center. And then I continued to um, work with asylum seekers um, and um, immigrants through Catholic charities. And I just felt like, and I worked, as, I volunteered as a translator and a screener. And it just, I just became very frustrated. I felt like, I knew I was helping, but I wasn't helping enough. And I thought, well, I am an artist and I am a storyteller first and foremost. So let me use my ability to tell stories to, to tell these people's stories. 
because nobody does listen to them. They are, you know, the cliche in the shadows. They're, you know, there's all this rhetoric like Jamie, Jeremy was talking about. So I wanted to be able to, you know, in my small way, just kind of uh, give voice to that. Um, um, what was the other, it was a two-parter question or is that it? Uh, what was what do you hope it will bring yeah okay. and i hope that um and in particular so so i wrote this piece first as a play and it was about uh, they told me something about human trafficking and immediately i thought about a, a particular woman and a particular story um that maybe could have been possibly uh been a victim of human trafficking so i decided to explore that I was interested in de tackling labor trafficking in particular because as Pat said, we discuss sex trafficking a lot. And again, not to belittle that issue, but I just felt like it's very easy for people to just say, oh, that's sex trafficking, that's awful, but I have nothing to do with that. I don't, I don't hire prostitutes. I don't watch child pornography. I don't really have anything to do with that. But with labor trafficking, we are all involved. Right, right now I'm shocked because I'm a, I have a Disney Plus account and I'm like, oh my God, I need to, I need to cancel that. You know, we all eat, you know, um, produce and, and, um, and uh, meat from companies that take advantage of workers. And um, so we're, we're all part of this somehow. And I feel like not to point the finger, I'm pointing the finger at myself as well, but I just feel like it's something that we need to talk about and hopefully make a, a, a decision, an informed decision about. Arlene? Yeah, I think to, to add on to that, I mean, I, you know, um, as, as an artist, one of the things that is most important to me is to hold a mirror up to society, to hold a mirror up to ourselves and to challenge um, common held beliefs and, and maybe make people a little bit uncomfortable, you know? And I think um, that this film opens a conversation, you know, like I said before. And first and foremost, that is why I got involved in the film, um, to, to shine a light on something that is not often talked about I think our, our biggest hope for this is that we get on some major platform, not Disney, <laughs> but to get on some major platform so that more people can just, you know, be thinking about this, this issue and, and, and specifically with labor trafficking, you know, what are the ways that we are complicit? What are the ways that in our daily lives we are being a part of, of um, an industry or, or, or a practice that is hurting other human beings. And what can we do to stop it? Thank you for that, Aline. That's a, that's a serious issue we have to tackle. There's a question here, I believe, from Mar Marcelino, and it's about, it's about Disney again. The question is, what is the entertainment business, or in this case, famous actors, what are they doing to confront companies like Disney? Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any insight here. I mean, there are plenty of, of activists and you know people with influence that um, are doing good work. Um, I know um, Laura Dern comes to mind. She's done a lot of stuff advocating around uh, women migrant workers, women in agriculture. Um, there are plenty of people who are using their platforms to, you know, bring attention to issues and kind of signal what kind of things we could do or pay attention to. Um, both Cynthia and Arlene mentioned, though, I, I think it's really important, though, is it takes all of us to get to a point where it, it makes a difference. It creates uh, a change in somebody's bottom line. Um, and that's a hard thing to do, but there really is some power in, you know, popular movements, boycotts, et cetera. I don't want to get too radical here, but um, that's a way for all of us together to, to really create change. Um, you know, not to digress, but really quickly, you know, there are, 
big companies right now who are refusing to fund certain politicians for their recent actions. You know, this, this stuff matters at some, on some level. And the more that we can create this kind of awareness and get people involved, uh, the greater the chance is that we can all have a real effect and change some of these things uh, for big companies that, you know, would actually make a difference in the labor market. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Can I, can I add also um, uh, two points? One is to, uh, to Jeremy's point about, you know, bringing more, much more awareness and, and uh, you know, rising to the cause, if you will, a, a number of years ago, um, there was a very large uh, uh, uprising, if you will, a movement against, and I, you know, I hesitate to use company names, but I will, is Hershey, which is the largest producer and manufacturer and seller of chocolate. They get most of their chocolate from the Ivory Coast. Most of the people who work at the in these plantations are children. So um, there was groups that were meeting with them continuously and it was a big public outcry. It took years and years and years. They are finally now coming to the table and saying, okay, some of our products we will actually uh, we will not use forced labor, but there's a whole lot of issues behind that as well. Um, so there is the potential. Don't give up hope. You know we can continue to keep moving in this in this positive direction. Back to the the question previously, just quickly, the transparency of of companies. There's an excellent organization called Verite, V E R I T E dot org. Jeremy shaking his head, he probably knows it, and so do you, Michelle. Um, that really is, they've been around for a long time, go on their website and you can get lots and lots of different, different kinds of information, particularly the transparency of the supply chains, which is becoming more and more, um, you know, important in the, uh, the abolition. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Pat. Um, there's a question by DJ Kanar, and he asks about how many agricultural H2 workers are in New Jersey, and do H2 workers, do they normally come with your children? Um, when I saw this question popped up, I went and looked at the Department of State spreadsheets really quick. Uh, about 1,800 H2A workers came to New Jersey last fiscal year. Um, not a huge number, but enough, you know, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the other two parts of these, you know, do H-2A workers rotate seasonally? Uh, typically, they do not. Once you accept a position and you get the visa, you are tied to that specific employer for the duration of your visa. There are, you know, provisions where you can change employers without leaving the country, but in practice, that's very difficult to do. And it creates other problems. Um, in the case that I highlighted, uh, workers were taken from Georgia to Wisconsin, uh, not in any kind of legal fashion, but that took them from one area of somewhat familiarity to a totally different region where they had no contacts and created additional vulnerabilities for them. Um, very quickly, some of the rules were changed in the last year, you know, with the pandemic where it's much easier for a worker to remain in the country for over one year and transfer employers. But a bunch of us at advocates pointed out that that does create additional problems where you have recruiters now approaching workers who are seeing this great opportunity. They don't have to go home. They don't have to spend the money. They can transfer jobs. But again, you're setting them up to potentially accept jobs where they don't know what the conditions are. They don't know where they're going. They have no contacts there. And the system is set up for maximum benefit for employers it's not set up to protect workers in the same way. And you know that again is something that we can all pay attention to and try to advocate with politicians to set up a system that works for both employers and workers. Um, everybody can benefit. Uh, we just need to change the rules a little bit. And kids don't come. Uh, it's allowed technically, but it never happens because employers don't want that responsibility. They don't want that burden. They don't want kids in the field or in houses. So they don't. Yeah, that's true. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, this is a question that I kind of like created 
So what, what, what can we do to prevent our families, friends, and community from being victims of human trafficking and forced labor? Are there anything we can do to prevent that from happening? Anyone wants to take that question? Michelle? That's a, that's a woo. Um, I think uh, there's a, I guess there's a couple of strategies. One is to learn as much as you can about what human trafficking is, uh, this, uh, uh, the signs and symptoms, if you will. Uh, also to, if you're talking about, well, if you're talking about forced labor, obviously as a consumer, there's so much that you can do. If you're talking about sex trafficking, uh, particularly now, and I mentioned this before, uh, with teenagers and even younger people who are online more and more, it is so, so important that they are monitored um, and also that they become aware, not only that they're monitored, but they have to be uh, taught and uh, given the guidelines of what they should look for. A couple of years ago, we did have a panel presentation on that subject. We had the DA from the Bronx who really explained it thoroughly, but that's extremely important. Um, and it's so easy for traffickers now because it's, you know, uh, they're, they're hiding behind everything and they just befriend these kids. And then the next thing you know, well, meet me in the mall. Well, that's it. So, yes. Those are, those are two things that come off right off the top of my head. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, just a, that's great, Pat. You're completely right. I think generally, you know, whether it's family, friends, workers who come to the United States, what, what are your rights? And if you have questions about your rights, where can you go? I think those two things, if all of us had those tools, um, would be much better prepared to at least access the information that would give us a chance to know if the situation is legit or not. Um, and that so often is denied to all workers in the United States. Um, that's really important, rights, education, and options for legal questions or counsel. Thanks. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, I just want to give a quick announcement. You know, I know our tech has put that in the chat. So if you want uh, information, you can email Social Justice Ministry. And, you know, we can share with you additional information and PowerPoints if you would like to get that information. So just send us an email and I think our, our tech will put that email in the chat as well. Okay, I have, a, I have a question here in regards to immigration laws. So what role can immigration laws and policies lead to tackling the issue of forced labor and human trafficking? immigration laws and policies, what role can that lead to tackling this issue of human trafficking and forced labor? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat that one part of it? Because I, um, I had yeah. a tech issue, something was beeping on my computer. No worries. So what role can immigration laws and policies lead to tackling the issue of forced labor and human trafficking? Yeah, I mean, I touched on that a little bit, right? I mean, I think the, the biggest piece is, um, well, relative to, to what Jeremy was saying, it's creating rights and access to those rights and having a way for people to access protection and safety and, and labor in a way that is um, that is that doesn't create this power imbalance, right? So you, you want to avoid having being out of status be a crime. I mean, that's sort of the fundamental piece. It's, you know, being undocumented is not illegal. Um, that's, I think, the most fundamental piece. So creating accessibility and a fair, safe, accessible, uh, you know, orderly process. That's the key. Um, and a welcoming process as opposed to a punitive process. So that's the general way. I mean, I could go on for a long time on all the specifics, right? But um, the other one piece I would say um, regarding, for example, just specifically on trafficking, the T visa. I mean, one of the big issues with that visa is that you have, it's very much based on a prosecution and on enforcement of um, the crime as opposed to protecting the individual that is the, is the victim or the survivor. Um, and so that really has to shift. And again, I think that goes into the accessibility of a process. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, that's all the questions that we've, that we've got so far. Does anyone want to share a few statements or words or want to say something before we 
look to close this event. Our panelists, any any comments you want to? No. <laughs> okay. So I just want to thank all our panelists, Jeremy, Michelle, Pat, for coming and joining us, Cynthia and Aline for sharing the, the awesome film. We appreciate you. And without further ado, I just want to say thank you. And uh, hopefully we can get you back if there are more information you'd like to share with us. So I just want to respect everyone's time. I know we're about six minutes over the event. So thank you all and look forward to hearing from you. And the email is right there. So if you want to get in contact with us, don't hesitate to contact us. And Jeremy has also provided us information as well. So Jeremy, Michelle, Pat, thank you once again. We appreciate you. Cynthia, Arlene, thanks for the film. Thank you, Cynthia. Wonderful film. Arlene loved it. Yeah, really great job. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, and thank you for all the for all the participants for the questions. Those are very good questions. So we appreciate you participating here as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much.